Hello and welcome to this special session of ASNIC 2021. Show me how to sew me. Boy, do we have an all-star lineup for you today. We are so excited that each and every one of you are able to join us. So let's jump right in. I have no disclosures. The chat box on the corner of your screen is being monitored. So as you think of questions, go ahead and send them in as we have a live panel discussion at the end. And before we begin, make sure you're following our fantastic virtual moderators, Viet V from Intermountain Medical Center and Madison Coker from Medical University of South Carolina as they live tweet all the action. First up, I am so pleased to introduce Amit Goyal, AKA the OG cardio nerd. Dr. Goyal is an interventional cardiology fellow at the Cleveland Clinic. With a passion for med ed, he co-founded CardioNerds along with Dr. Danielle M. Binder. In this capacity, he's designed the CardioNerds Academy, Narratives in Cardiology, and Medical Journalism, and scholarship programs. He served as the Educational Editorial Fellow for the ACC FIT Editorial Board and Associate Editorial Team Lead for ACC.org's Pericardial Section. Welcome, Dr. Goyle. Well, Dr. Shetty, thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here, and uh, especially so with uh, such a great panel uh, to talk about an area that is uh, is very, I think, fun and important, the power of social media. And my part will be from the fit and early career perspective. First off, my disclosure is as I'm co-founder and have equity cardio nerd. So for the audience be forewarned that I am a giant nerd. I think to understand the power of social media, first, we have to contextualize it looking back at what our traditional paradigms have been. And I think we all remember uh, being in the classroom, being uh, learning from uh, an incredible professor, um, you know, where the flow of information is uh, predominantly uh, unilateral, um, apparently here about cardiac nuclear isotopes. But in this paradigm, you know, the, the, the students are one of many, but really there's no great value placed on their individuality, their, uh, their philosophies and their personalities. And you know, even if you extrapolate this to other domains like textbooks, journals, even up to date and COVID era webinars, the flow of information is still predominantly unilateral without much input from the audience, which you know, incredibly, I'm sure has much to add. So reformulating this, again, you've got the professor teaching the students is a very fine distinction between the teacher and the learner, um, usually mostly within the, the institutional walls, whether that is a brick and mortar institution or our uh, subspecialty society institutions. Enter social media where the flow of information is now bi-directional and there is great value placed on every individual and the distinction between the teacher and the learner breaks down and we can learn from everyone for the value that they add in the world around them. But even more than that, this breaks down the paradigms and the boundaries of our traditional institutions because now we have access to the minds and brilliance and talent of people everywhere. You know, we'll get to hear from the international perspective and perspective of uh, uh, people in different career stages. And now the conversation is not just bi-directional, it is multi-dimensional. Uh, so the question that uh, I was asked to talk about is really what is in these lines of inflammation, in, not inflammation, but information from the fit and early career perspective. And I think we can break this down into two main areas. It is the community in social media and the content that we are discussing. Within the community, I think there is a lot of benefit to be derived from the networking, the collaboration. And I use the word sponsorship, but really this is a place where for all the different ways that we can support one another. Um, sponsorship, mentorship, visibility, just being empathic and understanding towards one another. So, you know, as a, as a medical trainee, I've, I love uh, uh, learning from case reports and case studies. So I'm going to use a case study to just illustrate the power of the community and how we can leverage it. So uh, meet Dr. Devesh Rai at the time that this story was unfolding. He was a third year uh, resident, internal medicine resident at Rochester General Hospital, who at this early career stage began uh, being interested um, in the issue of professional diversity. He noticed around him how 
uh, cardiology still is a man dominated field and began interested in thinking about, okay, like what is the place of professional diversity in cardiology? And, you know, within the four walls of his institution, he had a hard time finding people who had expertise in the area and were able to provide him mentorship. So he, he turned to cardio Twitter and started looking, he said this for over months, he started following people who were clearly leaders in the area. And he came across two amazing women in cardiology, Dr. Martha Galati and Dr. Aaron Mikos. And again, this interaction was bi-directional. He finally worked, the courage, worked up the courage to reach out to them, but they fed back to him in incredible ways. He was telling me the networking, he met so many amazing people. He said he became a better scientific writer. They challenged him to become better. And this led to two first author papers in impactful journals describing the national trends of sex disparity in the societies around us with a third paper in the way. So again, Dr. Devesh Rai, Dr. Martha Gulati, Dr. Aaron because these are extraordinary individuals. I'm thankful to and grateful to know every single one of them, but this story is by no means exceptional. This is just an example of the different ways that we can leverage the community in social media in productive, um, to do productive things. So that was the community, but what about the content? And I think that immediately there are three areas that come to mind, and that is advocacy, education, and science, the content of the communication that is being had on social media that is productive. So, you know, with science, just Again, case in point, what are we doing right now? Hashtag ASNEC 2021, we've got social media moderators that are disseminating the science and medicine and education that will um, happen at ASNEC over the subsequent uh, coming days. But as a, another uh, feature of social media, these cardio Twitter journal clubs and Twitter chats are such an amazing way to harness the power of the community to advance our understanding of science have in-depth discussions with leaders in the field, but also mid-career folks, early career folks, fellows, there are residents, medical students that engage in these discussions, donate an hour of their time just to make, I think, the world a better place in discussing the science, getting deeper and talking about the nuances. After hosting a few of these, we realized the potency of these conversations and wrote a perspective piece and a general cardiac failure, where we thought, okay, there are six, I think, main areas where we can derive benefit from Twitter journal clubs, and that was one expert engagement, but but powered with learner empowerment, right? Because because now you have people from all creeds and training levels able to communicate on the same field. Uh, across field collaboration, we felt that this was a, a great way to harden an uh, environment that was suitable for adult learning, uh, an ability to have critical appraisal of science that um, was outside of the usual uh, conflicts of interest, and also a way to uh, promote diversity and inclusion by engaging everyone, regardless of where they're from. We talked about advocacy in science, and I want to talk about, sorry, next we'll talk about advocacy. And there are so many different ways that um, the incredible community on Cardio Twitter is advocating for areas that are important to them. But I, again, let's go to a case study. I'd like to introduce Dr. Sherilyn Abobi, who is now a first-year cardiology fellow, advanced heart failure bound, also a book author at the University of Chicago. But uh, you know, not as a fellow, not as a resident, but as a medical student, uh, made this comic and alter ego, uh, Shirley Whirl MD, and uses this to, um, you know, for advocacy around the areas that are important for her, one, to reflect her experience as a medical student, resident, and now fellow, but also her experience as a Black woman. And she does this both on Twitter as well as on Instagram. And so, you know, I want to draw your attention to the comic on the right. This is her walking in the halls. It's called Mirrors. There's a hallway in my hospital that showcases the graduation classes of the Pritzker School of Medicine through the years. In the subtext, she says, this comic is a call to action to the admissions committees and program directors across the country. I'm asking that you look at your selection criteria. And she goes on to talk about how we need to make the selection criteria more inclusive uh, for the betterment of our field. So there's science, there's advocacy, but an area that is uh, near and dear to my heart is education. and. You know, we um, enjoyed making the podcast, but we wanted to get more into um, digital education. So we established the academy where we were able to recruit an extraordinary array of residents, fellows, even medical students that are split up into these houses and go through blocks where they learn together how to promote education um, and create education on social media, tutorials, infographics, these journal clubs that we talked about and more. And another case study here, Dr. Ahmed Ghanim, at the time of this creation, he was an internal medicine intern when he made this right heart catheterization infographic, really getting into the nuances of um, pretty advanced hemodynamic interpretation. And I think this was a really um, 
uh, a poignant process because, you know, he spent a lot of time making this infographic. We had a lot of back and forth. We had several revisions before he put out version 1.0. But the power of the community, again, it's not unidirectional. It, unidirectional. it is bi-directional. So we got a lot of feedback back um, about additional nuances and references. Uh, we took we went back to the drawing board and created version 2.0 with even more input. So, uh, uh, you know, the, again, Ahmed went in as a teacher and we all came out learning from the community around us and having a product that was even better at the end. And now I've seen this in print version and CCUs in different places. And it's just his impact as an intern, I think, was just absolutely extraordinary because, again, he as an individual had so much value to add to others around him. Dr. Gurleen Kaur now is an internal medicine intern at Brigham and Women's, but at the time of this creation, she was a fourth year medical student uh, when she created this uh, tutorial on coronary artery calcium scoring. And uh, not only did I learn a lot from the tutorial itself, I learned so much from the engaging conversation that ensued that included uh, leaders in uh, radiology and the community around. And, you know, she's getting responses like, are you sure you're an incoming resident, not an incoming cardiology fellow? Again, just highlighting how, how you know, this community really put, places great value in the individual and what they have to add as opposed to necessarily their level. So, you know, these, I think, case examples are um, powerful in and of themselves, but what is the value of education and social media when taken together is their data and there's not much data but we're trying to gather data so we've uh, for our tutorials we have polls um, to try to start to get at this um, and so you know each tutorial has a primary learning objective and so when we ask in the beginning i feel confident with this learning objective in the beginning of the tutorial less than 30 percent said agree towards the end of the tutorial it was over three quarters and then at the end of the tutorial, when posed the statement, I learned something in this that may change my clinical practice, uh, over 85% said agree. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this is flawed data because this evaluates people's perceptions and not their behaviors, but I think is, uh, is definitely a very important signal and mandates that we not only continue to promote this, but develop ways to study this and then harness it to really integrate the use of social media in improving medical education more broadly. So again, we talked about the many, many different ways that social media can add value for not just the fellow and early career, but the uh, spending the entire trajectory, the arc of medical education from the early student to the late career. And we'll hear more about that. Um, but so, you know, we began to feel that it was an imperative for our institutions to equip our trainees in how to effectively engage in social media. And so we partnered with like-minded institutions like Nephrology Social Media Collective, Core IM, IMED, um, and Bedside Rounds to create a document how to build a digital education curriculum that was provisionally accepted. So again, I think, um, you know, just this is, a, this is a great sign here that societies like ASNEC and people like Dr. Shetty are um, creating uh, these sessions to start um, you know, placing value in this area, but I think we have more work to do and, and definitely excited to see that this is happening. You know, we talked about the community, we talked about the content, um, but I think it is so important that we not just use social media effectively, we safeguard our trainees from harm um, to not use it in ways that are destructive and only use them in ways that are pro productive. Um, and so there are several cautions, and I think the three major areas that we have to continue to be mindful of um, not passively, but actively, is working together to combat misinformation. That is uh, a responsibility that we all hold together, protecting our patients' privacy and dignity, um, as well as uh, modeling professionalism, uh, both just as a reflection of us, as a reflection of our employers and uh, our societies. So I want to thank everyone um, here. I want to especially thank this incredible community within the Academy and the Cardi Twitter community broadly. Thank you. That was fantastic, Amit. Your work is so inspiring and so impactful for so many of us, and it was a true pleasure to have you today. And okay. next up, it's my true pleasure to introduce the fabulous Dr. Neeti Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal is a non-invasive and advanced multimodality cardiac imager at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Not only does she write books, her curriculum vitae is as exhaustive as the book itself, and she's been nationally recognized in the fields of cardiovascular imaging and sex differences in cardiac disease. 
She's authored numerous peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, served on scientific program committees to organize both ASNIC and SCMR's annual scientific sessions, and is on the editorial board for the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. She's very well known in the ASNIC community and serves as the vice chair of both the membership and social media committees. She also serves on the American College of Cardiology's Cardiovascular Disease in Women Committee. Last but not least, she is the editor of the leading book titled Sex Differences in Cardiac Disease, released to a lot of applause earlier this year. Welcome, Dr. Agawal. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Good evening, everyone. So I'll be giving you the mid-career perspective on how to harness the power of social media. I have no financial disclosures. For anyone that may be questioning the power of social media, regardless of your political position, I think we can all agree that social media contributed to the government co-ops and for those that follow stock exchange to big financial swings. On Twitter alone, there's 700 million users, 40 to 50% of which are active. In addition, there's 9,000 tweets released every second. 9,000 tweets every second. That alone is the power of social media. So how did the journey begin for me? It was actually, I, I tell the story quite openly, in ASNIC 2018, a mentor of mine on the program committee paired me um, with two of my mentors and basically told me that I was going to be live tweeting a session. At this point, I didn't really know what Twitter was. It was a black box. I did not have a Twitter account. So I was forced to basically get on Twitter. And someone reminded me of my favorite Yoda saying, I just got to do it. There is no try. I got to do it. So I logged on to Twitter, figure out the basics. I was still in denial. And then during that meeting in 2000, ASNIC 2018, I had my aha moment where I said, okay, I think I can reach some people. This makes kind of some sense. A few months later, I think I got into the cool people club. Uh, it was a lot of work to be tweeting, but I sort of, you know, I was one of the cool people. I was now a nerd. I was tweeting about things. And then eventually it falls into place. And I can, I think some of my friends now say that not am I only tweeting. Sometimes I talk in 280 bite-sized characters because that's what I'm all thinking about. So for me, harnessing the power of social media would be through education, collaboration, dissemination, public engagement, leadership opportunities, and I want to definitely make sure we cover some social media pitfalls today as well. So let's start with education. For me, on a day-to-day -day basis, I am enamored by competing time commitments, expenses, and now COVID. None of us can really attend live conferences, which is why we're all presenting on a virtual level here. It's hard to keep up with journals and guidelines. And textbooks, let's face it, often get outdated. So what we really need is up-to-date nuggets of knowledge broken down into 280 character bite-sized summaries presented to us as tweets, tutorials, polls, journal clubs, and podcasts. As an example, when trials and guidelines are released, they may be up to 280 pages long. And what we really need to do is bait it, uh, uh, break it down into bite-sized characters so we can get different perspectives of people. And of course, if we still want to go into in-depth, go back to the guideline. As an example, this image right here, I would have normally said, this is a little too basic science -y for me. I'm not sure I want to read this article, but I think I could take away the key message from the article, which I saw on Twitter, basically saying that in COVID-19, ACE inhibitors and ARP should be continued for when there's an indication. Needless to say, I have to mention, I am now addicted to cardio nerds, and I am truly honored to be uh, presenting with Dr. Amit Goyal, who you just heard from, a co-founder of Cardio Nerds. Those were my forms of education. But education on social media, as Dr. Goyal said, is a two-way street. Not only am I learning from social media, as a mid-career physician, 
I have the ability, this is my platform, to also educate other people, including my fellows, trainees, etc. cetera. Um, as Dr. Shetty mentioned, I am the uh, social media editor of Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. So in the midst of the pandemic, we had released this tutorial talking about, uh, or at the onset of the release of the guidelines and best practices for nuclear cardiology uh, during the COVID pandemic. We often do polls highlighting clinical cases. When the ischemia trial was released, we had experts from across the globe almost instantly tweet about, is myocardial ischemia still important after the ischemia trial? We got different perspectives from experts, basically highlighting that, yes, there is still a value of stress testing. More perspectives, different perspectives, some talking about uh, the ischemia trial and how it needed to be turned into a musical parody. And so, as you can see, you get a lot of different perspectives from across, across the globe uh, at your fingertips. So moving on to collaboration. For me, the publication life cycle starts with an idea. You move on to collaboration. You experiment or do your research. You publish and ultimately disseminate. Social media has helped me in each one of those realms. So as an example, we published this article, Social Media in the Era of COVID-19. The idea came, of course, from social media. My collaborators, Mamas Mamas and Mirbat Alasnag, I met them on social media. So that's where we collaborated. We wrote this whole paper using the social media, i.e. Twitter uh, platform. We published it in um, a journal, and then we disseminated it using tutorials and tweets on Twitter. As another example, just to highlight the power of social media, so there is, I'm sure you guys have all heard of it, the uh, INCAPS COVID registry. A lot of the recruitment for this registry actually happened on social media, and this registry was able to include 650 laboratories in over 90 countries in the midst of an active pandemic where we really couldn't socialize or network uh, through the traditional means. And there's been multiple publications. I'll highlight just one of these. In addition to collaboration, so it has also served as my auto raft. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group with a lot of uh, cardiologists on it and saying comments like, I don't want to go to work today. I am scared of the COVID pandemic was okay. Um, I have met a lot of, uh, I think almost pretty much all my speakers and our moderators uh, on Twitter first and foremost before I met them in real life. Uh, so it so to me, social media or Twitter has really been an amazing platform to network and collaborate and hopefully develop lifelong friends. It is also helpful to disseminate. So as the, journal uh, as the social media journal editor, we realize that Twitter activity is in fact associated with a higher research uh, citation index for different articles. This was in thoracic uh, surgery, but it, the same is prevalent in cardiology. Um, it is a great, great platform to amplify our own research. Here's another example. And then it is also a great platform to amplify and increase the reach of the conference. Last year for ASNIC 2020, we were able to reach 13.3 million impressions, which is truly incredible with uh, a total of 4,500 tweets. The other power of social media is instant feedback. I know our virtual moderators are posting right now on social media, and as soon as my presentation is done, I'm going to know what my audience liked almost in real time and what resonated with people. And that is the power of social media. Um, public engagement. So uh, I think it's important to create your own brand and professional image. For me, I see myself as a uh, women's heart expert. So I often post articles related to that, promoting heart health in women. Um, as many of you know, I did publish this book. And in February, I had a whole series of tweets highlighting uh, each chapter at a time. The book had 28 chapters for 28 days in the month of February. 
For many others, many clinicians have promoted um, health initiatives through perhaps drop and give me 20. And I want to highlight Aviat Lee here, who is our virtual social media ambassador. Um, for others, through carrots and healthy diet, maybe through hiking. And then there are others that may promote psychological wellness on Twitter. Moving on to leadership opportunities. So like I said, I'm the journal, uh, social media editor of the journal. I actually got TV interviews and speaking gig engagements through my Twitter platform. And it has really led to increased visibility. And I am the vice chair of several committees and on the ASNIC program committee now. So finally, I want to shed some light on the social media pitfalls and what to avoid and be careful about. Quality. Everyone's responsible for quality. Everybody can go on Twitter and post something. I think you have to be careful about what you're reading and are you going to believe that information. So there is a lot of poor quality of information. It may not be peer reviewed. It's not always a credible source. It may be unreferenced. It is often a superficial view. You cannot really learn a guideline in 280 characters. And these are opinions, not necessarily guidelines. Next, we need to be very mindful of inadvertent breach in privacy. Uh, I personally, it's my personal policy because the Mayo Clinic really discourages any patient information being posted online. So I actually don't, even as an imager, I don't really post a lot of nuclear images or clinical cases online because I'd rather just stay clear of that. That's just my personal approach. And then recognize that social media is really a reflection of yourself and your network. There are filter algorithms where what you see on your account is really based on your past searches, on your click behavior, and your location. And this really will help amplify your preconceived benefits. You basically see what you want to see. And so it reminds me of my favorite uh, Yoda saying, many of the truths that we cling to depend on our point of view. It's also important to mention the psychosocial effects. I think sometimes people can get very fixated on likes and followers and can have that perception that nobody likes me or get a false sense of um, amplification. And I think it's important to get out of this Twitter sphere and back into reality. The other psychosocial effect of this is it is 24-7. There is no turning it off. The Twitter will go on 24-7 no matter what. Um, and sometimes I have had to force myself, especially during the pandemic, to take breaks and say, today is a no screen time day. That's what I'm doing. Be also mindful of the Kardashian index. Uh, so people will, do, will go really far, I know this, uh, to get Twitter followers. Um, there is an article that was published that talks about the value, well, the popularity, which is, um, so this, the K index or the Cartesian index assesses the correlation with the buzz around the person. So the number of citations for a person, that's the value correlated with the number of followers that they have on Twitter, and that's the popularity, is reflective of the, the physician or the scientist being over-celebrated. A K-index greater than five suggests they're over-celebrated. Most cardiologists in this uh, article actually had a relatively low K-index, suggesting that they are not just social media sensations. Um, here's another example. So back in November 2020, uh, in the survey, Baby Yoda was getting more social interactions than any 2020 Democratic presidential candidate. So to conclude, I don't feel bad about it, though, because both Baby Yoda or Master Yoda, as well as Twitter, has really helped me uh, launch my career, and I've learned so much from both of them, so I really can't complain. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic, Neeti. For those of us who've heard Neeti's talks before, she's always so eloquent and so on point, and her slides are just beautiful. Um, and once again, Neeti has done a fantastic job. 
Um, our third speaker for today is probably one of the most well-known faces of cardio Twitter. With a massive following, Dr. Irwin's regular tweets educate, inspire, and entertain us all. Dr. John P. Irwin is the Louise W. Kuhn Chair of Department of Internal Medicine at North Shore University Health System and Clinical Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He completed his internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's also past governor of the state of Texas to the ACC Board of Governors. Dr. Irwin has also been inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators at Texas A&M Medical Co uh, College of Medicine and is on multiple guideline committees. As not only my chair of medicine, but also mentor and true advocate for he for she, it's my honor to introduce Dr. John P. Irwin. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. It's a, it's a very much a pleasure to be here uh, with this whole crew today. Uh, really, it has been fun, entertaining, educational, uh, as, as we say, edutainment, which is uh, a lot of the, the point behind social media. So I do not have, let's see if I can get these two forward, sorry. I do not have any financial disclosures uh, in terms of the financial part. I do have a disclosure that uh, when I initially got asked to do the late career section, I was a little wounded, uh, but I, I do plan, uh, Lord willing, to practice another 20 years or so. But uh, in, in the lead up to this, Dr. Lee uh, helped me to uh, make touch with Betty White and with Keith Richards, and they are both in full support of me giving this uh, lecture today. And also, I did become a grandfather about two and a half months ago, and so maybe that uh, sets me up well for, for being late career. I, I do like being fathers and grandfathers to all my learners uh, that, have, that come behind me. So uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to just walk a little bit through through my journey and kind of the oversights and the big things that I want you to consider as we're moving forward is try to understand your why. Why, why are you on social media? Uh, it's very important to know that because you'll know your platforms that are going to be better suited for you and how you want to structure uh, how you connect on social media. I want you to be kind to everyone. Uh, we all have bad days. We all have a, a desire to snark every once in a while. It's very common in medicine, but uh, avoid that. Be kind to everyone. You never know where they're coming from. The connection is the key here. Connect, connect, connect in any way possible. Uh, I love the fact, being a person later in my career, that now I get to connect with people who are many years my junior, but many times much more intelligent than I. And so I grow wisdom through that. So keep the connections across the generations. Very important. I'm going to warn you again not to feed the trolls, and we'll talk about a case study for that. And then again, just along with the snarkiness, avoid the cynical crowd. That group is well represented in social media. Uh, be something brighter and fresher than that. So I think most of us belong to one or more forms of social media, and I think it's important when you think about this to ask yourself why I'm on here. What, what, what's the purpose of this? And so the goal itself should not be social media, but the social media should help you to achieve your goal. Is your goal to become a better educator? Is your goal to become a more prodigious uh, in, uh, investigator and publisher? Is your goal just to meet more people and make connections of people across the spectrum? Think about that as you join. I'm very heavily involved in Twitter, as Dr. Shetty pointed out. Uh, I have a LinkedIn profile that I use basically as an online CV. I don't use uh, Facebook or Instagram professionally. I, I consider those kind of family albums for the most part. So uh, think about your why and those, those uh, other platforms can be used for other ways, but uh, keep in mind that some work better uh, depending on what your why is. Just to talk about my, my walk through this, uh, Dr. Agarwal and I probably share a little bit of common ground with this. I, I had had one failed attempt at Twitter uh, shortly after it came out. I basically created an account uh, and just watched people, listened in, and I, I thought, gosh, there, there is nothing productive out of this. All I was doing is seeing political arguments and one scientist trying to be smarter than another scientist, and, and so I, I trashed my account. I just threw it away. I don't know if I ever even tweeted anything, but I, I just 
trashed it. The day before the ACC scientific sessions in 2013, I ran across Dr. Ferris Tamimi, who had been one of my prior professors when I was at Mayo. And as I was talking to him, he kept looking at his phone. I was like, hey, you know, Ferris, we hadn't seen each other in a while. Why are you looking at your phone so much? He said, John, I'm, I'm so sorry. I've been sent here to live tweet ACC 13. And I said, well, what the heck is that? And, and he pointed it out. So we created a profile the day before the meeting started. Uh, my banner has changed a little bit over time because I, I like to show people what they may see uh, from uh, following me. Uh, I do mix both uh, business and personal. I think that it's important that people know that not only are we doctors and scientists, but that there's a personal story behind each, each and every one of us. And I think sometimes that can help bring it home, especially when our audience may be more of a lay audience. So uh, here's my first tweet ever. Uh, this was the first day of ACC 13, and Dr. Tamimi had uh, just posted a, a study that had come out about how playing Nintendo Wii actually improves surgical dexterity. And I, I pointed out to him that it was making it hard for me to argue with my kids about being on gaming so much. And he said, well, it's making it hard for my wife, too. So I, I sent him a prescription for his wife. Uh, and I also uh, added that they could dispense, too, so that his children could have their own. And uh, I started out with zero followers and went to 4,000 in the first three days of ACC 13. So I was immediately sold at, as to what the impact was it, with, with this was. I was going to sessions and people that couldn't attend. I was able to give them some background and some feedback as to what we were learning. And so we were all learning together and people would push back and I would try to answer the questions. And I could also go to the speakers and say, hey, you know, I got this question on social media. How would you answer that? And so it actually edified my own education in the process. Dr. Tamimi has been an important part of social media. He's actually the vice president of social media at the Mayo Clinic. And he's given about a 12 word blog that I think can help us all tells us don't lie. We should have learned that lesson in, in kindergarten, but it's still important. Uh, I think we need to teach some of our socialite and maybe political people to be careful on social media, but we clearly need to do that in the science fields and as physicians. Don't pry has to do with not uh, putting out personal information as Dr. Agarwal and, and Dr. Goyle had pointed out. Uh, so anything that could be protected health information, I tell people all the time that if you're gonna consider doing this, get informed consent from your patient to allow release of their images. If you really find something fascinating, I think it should be shared. But much like we would do with a case report, I think it's important to consider having the patient sign an informed consent for that. Don't cheat. Uh, you know, I, th I think that, again, goes without uh, uh, too much explanation, but what he meant by this is we're all prone to cutting corners, and it may be that sometimes we'll retweet something that hasn't been confirmed. Maybe it was a, uh, a poster that was presented at a meeting or something that's in preprint that we're just not sure. We haven't really studied the uh, information well enough to be able to share that, and we find out after the fact, gosh, I was too quick on the, on the gun with that. So I would tell you that if you ever get caught in that situation where you put something out there that you realize I was wrong. Admit it as soon as you can. Uh, don't try to retract it necessarily, but admit that you've made that mistake and, and move on because you, you will get caught and it will be ugly if you don't uh, pull the mea culpa. You can't delete anything. Even if you delete your tweet, it is electronically sealed uh, for, for anyone to be able to do the investigation and find. And so I, I have people also think about who your audience is because we each have two audiences on social media, those who know us and those who don't. Those who know us, if we tweet something and they take it out of context, they're going to say, well, you know, Irwin's a pretty nice guy. He didn't mean to hurt anybody by that. He, he just didn't think well enough before he, he put his 280 words together. There are other people, however, that are going to become quite offensed. Uh, uh, they're going to take great offense at this. And you may get shot at very hard uh, on social media. And so it's very important that before you hit that button to send something off, think about it in all the ways that people could potentially uh, understand that or construe your words there. Words are obviously very powerful. Don't steal. Retweet it, like it, quote, treat it, 
tweet it, but always give the person their uh, due when they put something up. It's very important to do this. Uh, you, you can lose credibility with your with your social media uh, family very quickly if you don't give proper uh uh, citation to where this came from. And the don't reveal here is, is actually, you know, related to proprietary type information. I, I made a mistake a few years back of publishing the Maslach uh, well, wellness or burnout inventory questions. And uh, unknown to me, uh, someone had bought uh, the rights to those questions. And uh, they reported me to Twitter as something that I shouldn't have done. And I, I did not know. I had used these many times in talks before and didn't realize that it was proprietary information. So good to do your research that way. I'm hoping to walk you through some of my mistakes so that you don't make the same ones. I, I'll go also to, to the education. Uh, uh, as Dr. Goyle pointed out, moving from a constructivist model to a connectivist model is very important. You know, this knowledge generated by information exchange and distributed across these connections with all of our learners, so important. We can get so deep in 280 uh, character tweets with people interacting, asking good questions, giving explanations, uh, and all of us can teach certain subject matter better than we can others. And, and so I think getting a reliance upon your network that you have uh, to be able to teach that way is extremely important. So we use it to network. I've met people from all over this world. It's made the world very small to me and very rich because of that. Advertise. It's, it's fine uh, to get your papers out there. Tweet it out. Get others to help you tweet it out. Get that altmetric score out there because ultimately when we spend a lot of time doing the work behind doing the research, writing that manuscript, doing all the revisions, we want people to see it. And we hope that if it's important enough to others that they may cite our work. And so you can advertise what you're doing there and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not something that is uh, skipping the principle of humility. It is, it is fine for us to do that when we're proud of our work. And then we advocate. You know, it's very important that we know the causes that are important to us, those things that can help other people, uh, and, and it's, it's key for us to do that. And the education, I think it's been spoken uh, quite in-depth and in, in much better ways than I can put it. But I do want to put out one more point related to trolling. This is Dr. Danielle Bellardo. Uh, at the time this event occurred, she was a fellow. She is now in private practice doing a wonderful uh, preventative cardiology job in California. But at the time, she was a fellow. And this guy here decided to attack her. And being one of the late career people, uh, along with uh, Mike Gibson, we called it out. And we had lots of other people call it out. And we defended Dr. Bellardo and basically called this person's professionalism into question. So I'll tell you, don't feed the trolls, but have your family, have your group that you can band together to discourage these predators because they're, they are out there. And the more following you have, the more likely you're going to have several of these that are going to come after you. You can mute them, and please do. I mute way more than I block, uh, so keep that in mind. I'm going to move through this one fairly quickly. Uh, it's been published in a Jack article. I, I'm pointing this out because it was a central illustration behind a paper that came together strictly through Twitter direct messages. We actually put the, the outline together of this paper that we did and published it in Jack. Many of the authors I had not met in person until after we had already published the paper. So this is the, the true power of social media for us. Disseminate, discuss, dissect, and deliberate. And then last but not least, uh, be, be cheerful with this. Uh, again, I mentioned before, there are, there's a lot of snarkiness. There's a lot of cynicism across so, social media outlets. Uh, don't be that person. There's plenty of room for others to do that. Find your own path, choose your own why, and act it out and help others. Thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. As usual, it was straight from the heart, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who you've given a lot, a lot of us to think about. Um, next up, we have a very special guest from all the way across the Atlantic. Dr. Biliana Parapid is Assistant Professor of Medicine Cardiology at the University of Belgrade in Serbia, an honorary Proctor W. Harvey Teaching Professor at her second alma mater, Georgetown University. 
trained in the U.S. and France, fluent in six languages, and founding chair of the ACC Women in Cardiology International Working Group. She's been advocating for the use of social media for healthcare workers, which got her the Euro Intervention Journal 2019 Award for Promotion of Education on Social Media. Dr. Parapet launched the Women's Heart Health and Cardio Obstetrics Program in Serbia and will run the first women's heart center in the region, which will be the third in Europe once it formally opens its doors soon. Welcome, Dr. Parapet. And of course, after two years, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thanks for the host for inviting me to, first of all, be second year in a row uh, social media ambassador. I, I might have, it looks like I have been slacking on the job the past two weeks, but it's not like that. I'm going to catch up. So uh, that's just the clinical work. And Dr. Agarwal, who well mentioned the, the groups that we share where we vent, uh, knows very, very well what we're talking about. So um, I'm going to try to share my screen. And now, yes, yes, please. And now I'm getting everything I don't want to get. This one, sorry. Why is he not showing me what I want to see? I'm so sorry. Just a second. Here it is. Smile. Okay, sorry. Sorry, everyone. So... To begin with, as uh, yes, I have no conflict of interest pertaining to this talk, but I happen to be awake. I happen to be a CV nuke aficionada, someone who actually had the privilege to to be for for some very short time back in 2004, having as her attending Dr. Sakara. So uh, uh, that was one of the reasons I, I, I regret a lot missing the first cases with the ACEs because I was on call that day and there was no Wi-Fi coverage in my building at the time. And finally, I'm just a SOMI apprentice that was heavily trained during the past three years by the ACC work leadership team, in particular by uh, Dr. Sonia Singh and uh, Gina Lundberg, who at the time have created this amazing social media package for ACC Week that I'm sure Dr. Agarwal was also alumna of. So uh, that's courtesy of these amazing ladies that we are here today. So I'm kind of stuck with sharing the international perspective here. But before I do, uh, let me just show you a bit my own surroundings. So this happens to be Belgrade and eventually sometimes you will all get, although we're cardio Twitter family, as I call us worldwide, I hope to that we will start eventually getting back to the, the new normal, which should include also live meetings and that I will be able to re-extend the invites to, to come back live to Belgrade. So this tiny little country, Southeastern Europe is Serbia. I am not 100% Serbian, I'm a melting pot, hence all these languages. I am fifth generation of Greek women in my family and uh, uh, Cardio Twitter also knows me as a very fervent uh, post, someone who posts a lot in Greek also. So, um, but that's also a regional Mediterranean heritage that I'm very proud of. Serbia takes a special pride in the fact that even the 14th, our first uh, constitution from the 14th century didn't recognize um, slavery as such. And all who stop, who managed to get to Serbia at the time were considered free citizens. And the, the modern, the first modern um, constitution of the 19th century, the Candlemas constitution actually abolished even feudalism as such or anyone being uh, subjected to anyone in any social way. So that is, I assume, one of the things that we should all be very proud in the region. Finally, the world, we know it from not before Christ, we know it before COVID. And uh, sadly, we've been living since March, February, March 2020, and some parts of the world uh, living it. This didn't come from courtesy of Chanel, it, come, it came from a 
from a farmer's market. We won't judge, but we will just we will just joke a bit. And uh, I, I dug this out uh, just a couple of hours ago from one of the one of the tweets that I was posting. I see Dr. Irving giggling. I, he surely remembers it when I posted it. And finally, we're living in the post-COVID era now, where actually whether you are living abroad or you're living in the most affluent GDP wise country in the world, it's sadly almost the same thing. Now, I assume a majority of us on the screen, not surely our fellows, but I belong to the generation whose parents had these, these uh, devices this we see on the left. And um, fortunately, I'm very happy until recently, my hospital phone was also a very simple uh, Samsung, this is not a, uh, this is not an advertisement for Samsung, God forbid, but it is not a smartphone. It's a stupid phone, and sometimes actually it's 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 almost as good as the good old beepers we used to have at Georgetown at the time of Doctor Secure. So, um, but now we carry these devices, and I deliberately put an infographic picture so that it doesn't look like a commercial again, and. For all those who are still hesitant about whether they're going to be chipped while vaccinated, don't forget that you are carrying already a tracking device with yourself. I mean, with your own consent for, for at least 20 something years. I mean, this is not a pro vaccine commercial, but it might be. So I try to actually not, um, I try to summarize what are somehow the pros and cons in the areas that we use social media for if you're trying to interact with some, someone outside of your own country or maybe comfort zone of your own language. So I kind of divided, I split a pie, of course. I, I, I still call them slides and I still love pies. So um, I split it into the professional and educational portions, which are somehow in our academic world. And I have been trained in an academic hospital setting, whether I was trained in Serbia, the United States and France, so that there is actually no professional activity without the educational component. And um, I believe they somehow overlap, no matter how we coined it, whether we call it also leadership opportunity, mentoring, sponsoring, it's pretty much the same, same melting pot, I fear. So in that regard, I would just like to remind uh, Dr. Urban was, he gave one of his amazing lectures as always, and, and Dr. Augerwall already mentioned it, but we have, if you're joining the social media, and trained as an MD, you have to be very careful who do you pick to follow and who you're, who you're eventually frustrated by because they have a gazillion of followers. But if you're an MD or you're a nurse, I mean, in Europe, we don't have all the subsets of the allied professions, hence my just MD and nurses, for instance, here, versus everyone else who is not MD. Don't be fooled because you, we are all undergoing heavy training everywhere and our hours differ very much from people who are in research and i am not saying that in a way to to either judge or to be mis to to say anything inappropriate towards anywhere because first of all i come from a three generational household in biomedical research so i know all the ends of the spectrum and nuke actually the best so uh Finally, that person that you're following is what are actually that person's credentials? Because one things are the things that you see them posting, as Dr. Agarwal wisely mentioned, you cannot summarize guidelines sometimes in, in the characters that we're offered, and we shouldn't. That's why they're called the guidelines. We're tailoring them to our specific patients who also have, finally in Europe, a right to something that is called uh, shared decision making. And lastly, don't be fooled by the social media appearances because that doesn't always represent the in real life presence and activity of someone. We have seen that even more during COVID. You have seen people who haven't seen a patient for over two years uh, posting fervently about how, how red zones should be managed and how what should we do and how should we do it. But that's all very sweet and nice and I appreciate it. It's an amazing advocacy tool. But sometimes it's 
uh, it's not so, although we always try to be kind, as Dr. Irving mentioned, it eventually does push your buttons if you spent like five or six months in a red zone and uh, someone is telling you how you should be doing it. I mean, I don't tell people how they should cast people. I'm not an interventional cardiologist. The fact that I know the trials, the fact that I know the data, that doesn't mean that in my country for decades, every woman who was full-time house staff employed in my hospital was signed her six months of interventional cardiology trainings because we have some booklets that we take around like crazy and we gather signatures for four years. But it was just because she was already working so much in her own words that no one in the cath lab wanted her to bother anyone. So my, the last time I, I, I did something that was a, a potentially a radial axis thing was it just me doing a routine uh, CCU gas blood draw and nothing more than that. So do I support my dear cardio Twitter family, uh, Dr. Merva Tarasnaj? Of course I do. She's an amazing woman. And I make comments that are linked to my area of expertise, but I'm not saying whether she should print, pick six or seven French catheter or something. Come on, let's be realistic. So that kind of created uh, a potential, not facility, but some, I think, fatigue in a certain amount of physicians who were, who were using social media. I know that one, at one point, even my, my U.S. colleagues sometimes say, wow, you're on Twitter all the time. No, I'm keeping myself away when I'm on call in the ER or awake someplace, but in between patients or awaiting results by staring at my screen frankly, not because I prefer being on Twitter, but that's somehow also my escape mechanism <laughs> from, the, from the local work that we, we are all overwhelmed with. So does, it, does that create collaborations? Of course it does. I, I deliberately, sh I'm showing here two snapshots of my two talk, of to talk I gave last year for AHA Go Red for Women Pakistan. And I shared with them because for instance, the Go Gold for Mommy that, was coined back in 2017, in September 2017, was coined actually by doctors Key Park and, and Carol Watson. At the time, I think we probably knew each other just from the ACC Quick Lounge saying hi, but we never interacted or anything else. But Go Gold for Mommy was coined on the internet just because, I mean, on Twitter, because we were discussing that it would be a very nice cardiobstetrics um, um, hashtag because if we have go red for women we should go gold for mommy why because all mothers my idea was because all mothers have a heart of gold for their children and do I do I use it for my talks of course I do but I always credit also my uh, two other pro partners in crime who who coined it with me back then and of course together with with our Dr. Wenger who is the academic mother of our all everywhere around the world and uh, who still mothers us that she can do we use it to compare it with our own regions? Of course we do. We do. This is also a slide I like repeating, and that was a discussion about a paper that appeared last year on the, on the maternal mortality rate comparing United States states with other corners of the world. So at the time, Dr. Alessandro and I were also commenting, and I was, I was saying, well, I don't know, Minnesota looks like Serbia, New Jersey looks like Turkey, and California like Hungary. So let's think about it. And these are all regional countries. So after the professional and the educational, there is the social component and finally the personal one. The social component is one we all share and that is something that you don't need to be. These are, for instance, my five favorite uh, Martin Luther King Jr. quotes. And you know, the sense of social just decency and kindness, that is not something we're taught in uh, kindergarten or elementary school or God forbid medical school. We teach our students ethics. We teach our students, like we also do at Georgetown, something that is cura personalis, which is actually shared decision-making and personalized treatment. But the, the sense of decency and the sense of manners is something that we fortunately are taught at home, as Dr. Irving also mentioned. Finally, the personal. The personal is the one that we potentially, as doctors, need the most nowadays. Burnout prevention, whether we opt to 
to hike or I didn't share it here because I was trying to be nice, but also my, my, my uh, Twitter family, Mamas Mamas, uh, and I love to share the good old uh, rum and raisin uh, uh, ice cream. And uh, we, I, you know, one of, how I picked during the, the three months of lockdown here last spring, how I picked the delivery service. Well, I picked the one that was delivering also rum and raisin from the, from the uh, gelateria, which is called Black Sheep. And uh, Mamas knows what I'm talking about. I'm not showing it now, but, you know, it's something we have all seen on Twitter. And finally, uh, our, our Dr. Lakshmi Mehta from The Ohio State University is, of course, our global burnout prevention guru. So if you don't know who to follow for, for advice on how to manage your own uh, borderline subclinical depression, because show me a frontliner who was not clinically or subclinically depressed, I don't think there is one. Go ahead and search for your own advice there. So finally, yes, you learn it there, but bring it home because that's the purpose that you managed to bring home. Like I, for instance, virtually brought home our Leslie Davis. It's her birthday today. It happens to be her birthday today, but she joined us three years ago uh, in one of the joint sessions. She's my, my uh, co-fellow member of the hypertension working group of the prevention council. And although we shift, the, it was due to a local, uh, issue te logistical issues uh we shifted the session and also leslie was juggling a deadline for a grant and eventually instead of being in belgrade she was she was up at five o'clock in the morning for the love of god because we had put the session in the program crack of dawn so that she can check catch a 2 p.m flight but that was not in the cards this fortunately she wasn't in belgrade but she was with us and the guy sitting next to me on the slide below is one of our biggest he for she's, and that is Professor Milan Edelkovic, who actually brought ACC to the region. And he was actually the governor of the first, first chapter of Serbian Republic of Srpska. These three amazing women, I don't know who to start first with, either with, with uh, Sandy Lewis or Annabelle Wolgon or last but everything but not the least, or Martha Golati. These three amazing women came to Serbia in a joint AHA ACC effort Back in 2018, Dr. Wenger was flying to, to Dubai directly for another meeting, so she, so she couldn't join us then. But eventually in 2019, Dr. Wenger did come to Belgrade. So do something good for your own patients and your own students. And this was actually the first, uh, it was actually one of the last events we had, I think, in Belgrade before hell broke loose in 2019. And finally, I'm not just repeating the slide. This was the same slide that I just show, showed this weekend to our annual uh, general practitioner section meeting of the Serbian Medical Society, where we discussed exactly, the, actually the four pillars that you can see here translated, of course, in Serbian and in Cyrillic. So whatever it is that you learn and collaborate with, try to improve your own local settings and uh, I'm going to close with a bunch of these collage pictures that majority of you have already seen and all these people here are my Twitter family and you can see here this was Mama's teaching me how to selfie <laughs> in August 2018 but uh, and uh, so with uh, without further ado I think I made it under 15 minutes I promise that I will cut it under 15 minutes so that we use more time for discussion. Again, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for the, for the invite. And it was an immense pleasure and a privilege to share the floor. Although I'm, so, I'm sad that we're not in DC. We were supposed to be in DC just two weeks. Okay. Enjoying some Indian summer, but that was not in the cards we hope for next year. And thanks again. Dr. Barbe, thank you so much. Your energy is truly infectious. Um, our last speaker for today, is also joining us from across the pond and is a part of ASNIC's international family. Dr. Ian Armstrong is principal um, nuclear medicine physicist at Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Dr. Armstrong has 16 years experience in nuclear medicine with interest in nuclear cardiology, SPECT, and PET. In addition, Dr. Armstrong juggles multiple leadership roles in various societies, including being chair of ASNIC's technology committee, Secretary of the EANM Physics Committee and member of the British uh, Nuclear Medicine and Society Scientific and Education Committees. 
Dr. Armstrong also has a keen interest in teaching and tutoring and has lectured on various university courses for the past 12 years. The mic's all yours, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you very much, Marin, and thank you very much again for the invitation. It's lovely to be here uh, sharing my experiences on social media uh, from, from a physicist's perspective. I will touch very briefly on what I have gathered from technologist's perspective towards the end of the talk. Um, and yes, trying to follow on from all of the fantastic talks that we've heard uh, throughout this session. And as again, this has already really been covered, but we, we can see already there's fantastic benefits to the use of social media in our field. Um, we can connect with others across the globe. Um, education, it's extremely good for. I like to try to showcase departmental achievements and raise the departmental profile um, by uh, tweeting them in various pits. Um, I always think it's a great way of acknowledging and recognising other people's achievements and promoting other people's achievements, which again is something that we see throughout meetings. Um, and I'm sure will be going on in the background as I and we have spoken. I think it's very good to stimulate discussion. Um, I, 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 I like to sort of try when I'm at, when I'm at meetings in person. I always like to try and get up and and and, and try and provoke a little bit of discussion at, at presentations. Um, and hopefully we can we can progress the field by exchanging ideas and, and moving things forward. And um, as Marin said in my uh, sort of introduction there, yes, it's support the roles of some of societies. So I'll just step back a little bit and think about what my role is as a physicist and has been for physicists over the years now. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. So we really try to ensure we've got technical aspects of the imaging in a high quality and provide support to the, uh, the physicians in, in delivering the best um, diagnosis possible. What I try to, when I'm, I'm posting on social media, is think that the target audience could be anybody. Um, I'm really not a big fan of jargon and, and making it very sort of exclusive uh, to your audience. So I try my best to, 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 to be as sort of wide appealing as possible in the language and the terminology that I use. Uh, I think that's, an ex you know, that's a really keen thing to make, you know, to make knowledge accessible to all. Um, and I try to almost think of social media as an extension of my role in the department. I sort of do what I do in the department. I'd like to try and think about doing it externally as well. Um, so this is me. Um, so like as I said, as Marin's already said, so I've been principal physicist here in Manchester for uh, what feels like an awful long time now. Um, I've been on Twitter for an awful long time. And this actually came out of, I used to listen to a lot of technology podcasts and things. And there's all uh, discussions about Twitter. So I thought I'd have a go. And um, as Dr. Owen said, uh, actually a lot of it, I, I just sort of sat back and listened. And it must have been about 18 months till I actually started tweeting. And again, it was very, very slow. Um, I do, and as I will sort of probably give the game away, I, I have mixed feelings towards Twitter because <laughs> it can, it, it, it's not really a professional uh, you know, platform, but obviously it can be used for professional purposes. I do have to confess, you know, I, I used LinkedIn an awful lot more. Um, you know, that is that is all professional activity on there as well. Um, yeah, so as role as the the physics committee, like I say, supporting the societies. I also run the Twitter, the social feeds for the the physics committee, where we try to uh, publicise and advertise committee activities, uh, meetings, webinars, um, conference sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, as I've said, what so what do I use and when? Uh, here are my two profiles again. I think it's keen to try and have sort of like a a fairly uniform uh, presence and, and appearance and things. So I try to make sure everything looks pretty much the same wherever I go. Also a nice showcase of pictures that I enjoy taking as well. Um, so, yes, Twitter is, as we all know, of course, it's not really a professionally orientated social network. Um, of course, like I said, you can use it, but uh, you wouldn't get a physics talk without talking about signal-to-noise ratio. It can have a very low signal-to-noise ratio, and you need to do careful filtering and following of things to try and get the most out of it. Um, it goes without saying, of course, it's character limited. I remember the days when it first started, it was 140 characters, and it expanded to 280. Um, now, so for me personally, I, I, I find it 
more challenging to have a wide reach on Twitter, um, probably because that's just, I don't quite put the investment into it that, that, that I could do potentially, but I find it takes more effort, it feels like. Of course, the one thing about Twitter is it's very much about the here and now. It's spontaneous. So when we're talking about meeting hashtags again here, uh, this is this Twitter will be, of course, the place where you would expect to get the instant feedback and promotion of things that are going on. Um, so just briefly, I won't really talk about LinkedIn much uh, through the, the talk, but just to sort of have the comparative points. Um, yeah, but, yeah, this is the more professionally orientated um, network, and I tend to sort of put a more verbose posts on there. Um, and I find it much easier to see things that I'm interested in all sorts of the time sort of from a professional perspective. And so from that point of view, I always think it's got a, it's got a high signal to noise ratio. Um, but of course, I've never really when we're looking at meetings it's ne it, it would never be the place to go so you know, like today i was chairing a session uh, for our british meeting and i was on twitter i had three screens on the go twitter and the chair feed and then the the, the, the live feed so i was dashing all over the place so um yeah that's that's where i was uh, promoting the, the the meeting so yeah just to, to highlight actually what i was talking about in terms of reach and I, not, not a sort of a woe is me, but this is just based upon personal experiences. So this is just a tweet that I made, I don't know, quite a long time ago. Um, and it's pretty low on the impressions. And of course, I'm sure everybody else in the panel has got much bigger reach than me. Uh, but um, this is something I just posted a few days ago on LinkedIn. And you can see the comparative difference of um, the, the reach that it does have. I think it just, you know, w use what works for you, basically. Um, so... Again, this is kind of uh, coming back to what a lot of people have, have already said, but this is kind of why I try to use social media. I think education is a big thing. This is kind of my number one uh, use of it, really. I think it's really good to try and create dedicated content for educational purposes. So um, this is just an example of um, some, some Rubidium data, um, and it was a nice teaching point. So then I went away and... Uh, this is what businesses do, isn't it, of course, generated some supplementary um, plots that uh, complemented what we've seen. Um, and again, I think, as we've said, you know, we, we know this is a character limited um, platform. So it's always important to remember that, of course, a picture or two or three is worth a thousand words in this situation here. So um, this is the kind of thing I like to do. And of course, we always tag in um, the, 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 the people that are relevant and try to um, they will respond and hopefully try and spread the uh, distribution of the material. Um, and again, one of the things that uh, this is what I like to do, this is what I was doing today. Um, I think it's a really nice way uh, and it's almost a unique um, uh, platform really to, for showing appreciation for others, others' works, presentations at meetings. Um, I think when uh, what the important thing to do, and I think, you know, just, you know, as a matter of courtesy and what I was trying to do this morning, I was chairing this session and, and actually trying to dig around on Twitter for the Twitter handles of the various speakers. And so I could actually tag them into the talks that they were doing. So I think that's a nice personal touch to make. Um, of course, we use the, the meeting hashtags. And I think it's, um, it's nice to uh, sit, if you sit in the audience, just if you've got juniors in your department, I think it's really nice to help them, give them some confidence for the work, obviously, in the case of Dr. DiCarlo, then we, we you know, not saying that he's a junior, of course, but um, it's just, I think it's a really nice, um, I think it's a nice way to, to show appreciation for work from, from others. Um, yeah, and just promote what the department is doing. Again, particularly, um, I think certainly outside of, of the UK, um, particularly with the work that we've been doing in some of the pet work, it really has helped us. And I've certainly noticed the, um, the reach that I think uh, tweeting about certain um, certain uh, aspects of work that we've been doing, I've been on um, TCONs with various people and, and people have known about the work we've doing, which is probably a combination through publication, but also been uh, trying to publicise the work that we do on Twitter. So, of course, it's just examples of, of, of work that we would do. And then, of course, when you get to, to publish, it's always quite it was nice to try and... Um, try and promote things. Like I said, I've always tried to sort of, I always try and take the personal element out of it, of course. And I, I'm very keen on and recognizing others. And again, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that a little bit later on um, as to sort of the sort of philosophy that I use when I'm on Twitter. Um, 
I think it's really good, as we've seen again, presenting ideas that may um, be useful for, for stimulating various bits of discussion. So this is some work we did looking at art, um, motion correction in, in heart scans and saying, well, actually, you know, you can perhaps derive the, the these metrics that which you could drive from your software they could be useful um for as a as a qc tool um so I, I, and when you're doing that and again have others have said um you know base things on data try not to, to, to just make things completely anecdotal um i think that's always very much a worthwhile strategy to take um and uh, again stimulation discussion looking at areas that i believe or you, you think that the, the field really could be good to look at in terms of attention. So this is a, a meeting um, preparation for some a meeting, the European meeting, which is going on next month, but actually equally relevant to this field because it's on uh, blood flow measurement in SPECT imaging and um, basically just looking at protocol standardization or actually rather lack of. And I think these kind of things are, are, are really quite important to, to highlight and say you know come, come on guys call to arms we need to this is something we need to look at and do something about um so yes departmental profile i think it's it's always fantastic to celebrate uh, good things that you get in your department so this is when we got back in 2018 the uh i'm not trying to make it a sales plug obviously um obviously you can see what type of scanner it is <laughs> but it was uh, it was the first of the the silicon photomultiplier systems uh, it was uh, serial number 001 uh, to go live in the world so it was an absolutely fantastic achievement for uh, our department so of course we were uh, very much um, proud of that and and i was very keen having i was in, involved in quite a lot of the, the discussion work leading up to the uh, to securing the the purchase and um, so of course we were we were very happy and um, and made a lot of a song and dance about it. So yes, uh, I, the golden rules, um, as we have seen. So Twitter can be, and of course you'll be very aware, very hostile. So I, I actually don't follow much on Twitter because I can't, I can't stand the hostility, and I can't. I, I, I just, I, you know, we talked about muting people, but I just, I just cut them out i just don't like it I, I, um so i think that's probably part of the reason that i probably don't quite get the reach i don't go digging for followers on twitter very much um i i yeah i, I just try and get along nicely and of course as others have um, mentioned you are or potentially could be representing your employer so you have to be very careful so my hospital as i'm guessing or the other hospitals for people in the panel we there is a specific document which is a social media policy telling you the do's and don'ts of of how not to get into trouble and how not to basically get disciplinary action if you do something inappropriate and misrepresent your employer in the public domain then of course you are going to be landing yourself in hot water it goes without saying but of course some people do need reminding just be nice um there you should be speaking to people on social media as you would speak to a colleague in the office don't hide behind your screen don't hide behind some kind of anonymous um twitter handle you know there's there's just it's just unnecessary like I, and i've said you know i say to people you don't you never get a second um change or change never mind <laughs> there is, you know what i meant a second chance to make a a a first impression and p particularly on um particularly when you don't have the face-to-face -face contact if it's purely via social media platforms it can be even harder to come back from something which has been potentially misinterpreted so i think it's 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 extremely important i think that's something i really you know i'm, I'm much more keen to talk about you know much more keen to focus on um it's <laughs> and this this really this really boils down to some of the things that irritate me on twitter it's not all about you the i think you know there's a lot of egos on on twitter um and who like to just tell the world how brilliant they are um, and I really, I just sort of don't stop following people like that. I just don't really have the time for it. And it's something that I really try and focus on from my own personal perspective when I'm, I'm um, thinking, um, putting things on, on social media. It's not, I'm great. It's no, I work for a great department. I'm part of a great team and we, we do great things together. And I think that's, that's the important thing to recognize. And again, I, you know, this is just goes without saying, read, think before you tweet. I mean, even, you know, just, typos i mean sometimes those include but just 
healthy debate is healthy debate is or debate it can be healthy but it, it it's it can you know you are sometimes leading a very very fine line um and it is just to be careful with things and you know always i whether it be on social media or 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 in person you know try to support comments and claims with data don't just give opinion on things like this i mean people that know me in the uk and when i present at meetings they'll know that i'm perfectly happy to make very blunt statements and and say if something if i don't think something's very good i'll say it's not very good provided of course i've got the evidence to back the the statements up i won't just say something is no good for because i don't like it or just for very subjective reasons so you know that's what i think is is um you know, a good a good sort of recipe for for doing well on on, on any form of social media, but particularly Twitter, I think. Um, but of course, remember it is okay to have fun as well. Um, so yes, um, you know, we we all need a little bit of light-hearted relief from time to time. So of course, the title of this talk was the physicist and technologist perspective. Now, like I said, I'm a physicist. I talked to our technologists here, interestingly, uh, and again, this is very much a sort of UK-based perception. Um, it's very difficult for me to comment on how things may be um, across in other, you know, across in the US. But there are a handful of people that are on Twitter, the technologists here, but they don't use it for, for professional uh, purposes at all. Um, so this afternoon, I was just searching on Twitter, and I searched for Arsenal Technologists, e and Technologists, New Commenting Technologists, and CNMMT. Nothing really significant came up in the search. Uh, there was uh, one person in the States had CNMT in the biog on Twitter. And I started trying to dig around for the professional groups. I know there's technology committees in the, in the British Society, in the EANM Society. There doesn't seem to be a great deal of representation. You, know, I, you can see that I've got the, uh, you know, I try to run the, the, the social platforms for the, the physics committee that I'm on. Um, but, yeah, the technologists seem to be on and I, a un, little bit underrepresented but like i say very much from from my perception and what i can gather i mean maybe things are different in in the us and uh, if anyone on the panel knows otherwise then then it would be nice to hear um but uh, yeah just to summarize i think being active on social media can certainly be beneficial uh, for your development particularly uh, I found from my own experiences, it's helped me connect with people that I wouldn't normally be able to meet in person, like people across, mainly in the States, mainly through in the cardiology route. Um, I think that's certainly helped me gain um, a lot of uh, recognition through ASNAC. I mean, when um, uh, Dr. Dabala approached me about taking on the role as chair, I was extremely flattered and thought, really, you want me to do it? Um, but um, she said, oh, yeah, you know, you, you do some great stuff and you do some great stuff on social media. I was like, well, thank you very much. That's really kind of you. So, yeah. Uh, so it certainly has opened doors for me, um, I, I, I think. Um, and uh, people have definitely been in touch with me, something that I may have posted, whether it be on Twitter, whether it be on LinkedIn, and said, oh, I've seen that this that you've posted. Uh, and we can open up some discussion back and forth and maybe look at um, collaboration. Um, yeah, and so, like I say, it's, it, I think it's definitely, for me, helped gain recognition outside the uk so with that i thank you for listening and i hope that was enjoyable thank you so much ian um i loved how you put you put emphasis on highlighting and promoting our departments i don't think we do that enough at all um that concludes our presentations for today we have all the panelists on now and i'd like to open the floor to at least a couple of questions i know we have about seven minutes and remember, there are no silly questions here. Everyone's here to learn and to evolve. So ask away, and you can submit all your questions in the chat box. Um, so just to start off, um, I see that Rosanna Morales asks, is Facebook a useful tool too? Sometimes Twitter can have some inappropriate language. Any of you guys who use Facebook? I think Facebook's get even lower signal to noise ratio than Twitter. So I would just say that I'm not very active on Facebook uh, at all, mm -hmm. but um, I think that uh, you know Dr. Parapet talked about a, you know a few different domains where social media can be useful. I think the social element of Facebook can be very powerful. 
like my wife, for instance, she's a nuclear, uh, she's a NICU fellow, and she follows, you know, breastfeeding moms group that helped her connect and get a lot of support uh, when it was really challenging to breastfeed and be in a, you know, busy uh, ICU. And, uh, you know, I've got friends that follow uh, Dr. Dad's group and things like that. So maybe less of the professional and educational realm from what I've seen, um, but I think there's still a lot of power in community um, and the social element of Facebook. Dr. Shetty, I agree with everything that's been said so far. For me, personally, Facebook tends to be a social platform. That's where I connect with a lot of my high school friends, mm -hmm. people, but I don't do personally a lot of professional activities on there. That said, um, I know like our Mayo has a big SCAD research network, and it was founded on Facebook. We, we recruited patients on there. There's a whole network. I still refer a lot of my SCAD patients to that Facebook website. So I think there's a role for it. But the, a lot of the medical community, at least in my uh, experience, has been on Twitter. Yes, like, like Dr. Agarwal, I, I do follow a lot of my high school friends, and interestingly, the ones that tried to cheat off of me and most frequently text me for free medical advice are also the ones debating me on my COVID advice at this point. So that's been my experience on Facebook. <laughs> I also, as Dr. Agarwal mentioned, I actually have an old Facebook account that I didn't close <laughs> years ago, and then um, it was started in a very sad way. We we were barely 26 or 27. I remember I just I was just made attending, and we lost a buddy from high school from some rare form of family colon cancer, and then a buddy of ours who managed to find like from a class of 35 of us, he managed to find 18 of us still almost, or our parents living in the same address. He says, "I'm not going to see you guys meeting in in the cemeteries," but so. Frankly, it's been a while, and it's just because of my social media activity with ESC, who around the meetings loves to post there. I didn't close my, my Facebook account. So basically, I, I use it very rarely. And now when I discovered, because we were also advised to use Instagram, which is a chore for me. So what I did was link the two and whatever I post on Instagram ends up on Facebook. But then I have to, especially during the COVID times, because I thoughtlessly post scientific content, sometimes shame on me. Then I have to run to Facebook, open it and close it to my friends or whatever. Otherwise, it's uh, hell broke loose. <laughs> I think it gives us an opportunity also to interact with the non-medical community. And if we get to harness that, that would be an interesting experiment. We just need to figure out how to do it. Um, I see that Rosalind Eldridge also agrees with you guys about using Facebook for friends only in the chat group. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, what do you guys think about using your social media presence for advancement in your academic careers? I think that uh, probably Dr. Agarwal would be best posed to answer that question. Mayo's done a tremendous job with that. Yeah, so Mayo, so, uh, Mayo does have some guidelines on academic promotion and social media presence and um, promoting both your research and science is, is part of it. So I think that's certainly okay. And to me, that's just one of the many aspects. I think like we've heard in pretty much every single talk, um, even if, so my institution obviously is Mayo Clinic. So even if Mayo doesn't recognize what I'm doing on through my social media platforms, my platform has really elevated my career and allowed me to get a national presence or perhaps even an international presence in cardiac imaging and women's heart disease and build world-class centers and meet numerous colleagues and patients. And all of that obviously act, adds towards my, my career, even if Mayo wasn't recognizing that. But I guess I'm very fortunate in that my institution does recognize those works as well. Any input from our international friends? Frankly, in this corner of the world, it's considered a waste of time or um, I'm not sure anymore what it is. For me, it's an occasional pastime, but surely I don't dedicate to it more time than I plan to for something. Whether it's promoting a project, a advocacy, doing a, an advocacy thing, or supporting a friend or a colleague, I frankly don't stand so much on, on Twitter. 
I think I'd just make one one more point that especially if we're looking at our altmetric data, uh, it's fairly clear that if we're, we're good with our social media presence in terms of both promoting our own work and others, that it helps uh, to get that seen by more, which is always good. Absolutely. Excellent points. And it seems like we have one more minute. So I just want to take this opportunity. This was a fantastic one and a half hours. Thank you so much to all our all-star panelists. And thank you to all of those who logged in, our beloved ASNIC family. Um, before I go, I would uh, like to say that I really hope to see all of you at our virtual tweet up. It's on Saturday at um, 7 p.m. Eastern, October 2nd. So it was a pleasure to have you all. Thank you once again.